I have been very excited to talk to you for uh, for a while now. Uh, just okay. because of some of the things that have been on my mind, and I think you'd be such a great person to have a conversation with. Uh-huh. And, I, and I was thinking, you know, that we could have, you know, instead of sort of interviewers uh, thing, that we could just have like a conversation between two writers. I just think okay. that would be a lot more more exciting and interesting. <clears throat> okay, all right. Yeah. So uh, this the idea for this talk started when um, there were fires at UCT, at the UCT library. And of course, uh, it was such a devastating <laughs> fire. And mm. so much was lost in that fire. So I was having a conversation with a friend about things lost in the fire. And um, of course, they said there was something like 700 books uh, um, that, you know, that, that burnt. And, um, but I was thinking a lot about how we've come to value um, the written word as, as a means of documenting um, knowledge and history. Um, and of course, you and I are writers, so of course we're part of that system. But of course, we know as Indigenous people that, uh, you know, there have been other ways traditionally of recording and uh, transmitting knowledge. Uh-huh. Um, and, and so I was going back to thinking about our relationship with oral, oral history and oral, oral storytelling. Yes. And, and I was thinking so much about how much of what goes into my books comes from things I was told in person or comes from, you know, growing up around elders who told stories and instead of writing them down, right? Yes. So that I have a very intimate um, relationship with, with oral storytelling. So I wanted you to talk a little bit about your relationship with oral st- storytelling and how it has shaped you um, as a storyteller and as a writer and as an artist. Oh, my goodness. In fact, indeed, um, you will find that many of us who grew up in a storytelling environment, you know, have had that intimate rela- relationship with, uh, with oral uh, storytelling, you know, the oral tradition and so on. In my case, in fact, I believe that I've been shaped by that literature, the oral literature or orator as they sometimes call it. I believe that I've been shaped by orator even more than um, other forms of literature um, uh, written um, or otherwise. For instance, I grew up in Johannesburg. I I grew up um, in in Orlando East and then later in Dobsonville. But every time, uh, when is December, we would go to the Eastern Cape, you know, yeah. and, which was the tradition those days. You find that uh, during you know, the December holidays for Christmas, people leave Johannesburg and go, those who still have a connection with some rural area somewhere, yeah. they, they go there, you know, to celebrate with extended family, their relatives and so on. So it was the same case with us. And indeed, when we got there, then you'll find that, you know, all the kids from, you know, different, because you see, we go to my grandmother's and grandfather's homestead. Yeah. And all their grandchildren would be there as well. Some coming from Cape Town, from Johannesburg, others from locally there. And in the evenings, it would happen that, almost every evening, in fact, as she is cooking there or other women are cooking, we are sitting around the fire and stories are told. Mm -hmm. Now, these were traditional stories. These were classical stories, stories that were passed from one generation to the next. Mm as they were. In other words, you didn't mess up with those stories because they they must come down 
from your great, great, great grandmothers, the, the way they are. Yeah. So we would listen to these stories and then we would also tell those that we know. But then there would be an occasion during the process of storytelling where then somebody would say, now is the time for improvising a story. It's called Ukukweba Ibali. Yeah. This is the time for it, to improvise your own stories now. That's when then you find that many of us would try to invent our stories. In many instances, they are based on the form of the classical stories, but the content would be different because it would be the kind of content that was, was about our lives, our, our present lives. Yeah. So we would display our skills then, you know, on uh, improvising a story which, which would be funny, would make people laugh, or, and so on. Little did we know that that was part of the process of training us to be storytellers, uh, not just tellers or repeaters of the ancient stories, but composers of our own stories. Mm -hmm. And I found that when I was writing uh, literary now fiction, fiction yeah. or plays and so on, I drew a lot from those stories that, that were told then. Mm. And in many instances, even my earliest play, which I'll say for the fatherland, I found that I was writing it exactly in the form that my grandmother used to tell oh. the stories. I was not aware, but you know, for me, that's how stories were told generally. Yeah. And then when critics read it, they said, oh, this is magic realism. Now, I never set out to write magic realism. I was just telling a story. Yeah. And the only way of telling the story that I knew is, was the way of my grandmother. You see? Yeah. So that's how then for me, um, stories in the oral tradition uh, were, were important. They shaped me. They shaped, you know. Because you see, in, in Johannesburg here, I would be reading comic books and so on. So they contributed also in my storytelling. Yeah. But when you get to the Eastern Cape is, you know, orator, you know, stories in the oral tradition. So a combination of the two, the, the literary kind of storytelling that I was uh, familiar with in Johannesburg, and then the oral uh, tradition that I got to know very well in the Eastern Cape, the two coming together uh, helped a lot in, yeah. in making me into the writer that I am. Right. Yes. I like that you say you, 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 know, you didn't realize at the time that you were being trained as storytellers. Yes. I, think, I think it's interesting that you say that because we think of a training as today, you know, we tend to think of training as something more, you know, within the confines of the academy, right? Um, yes. We don't think of ourselves as being trained as children. So this is a very interesting point that you make. I really like it. Yes, because of course, you know, those days, even today, actually, if you go to the rural areas, you'll find that a lot of what children learn is through socialization. Yeah. You see, there's never any formal, you know, uh, uh, that, okay, now sit down, let's, let us teach you something. Yes. Pe people live their lives and we learn from that. Mm -hmm. When they tell stories, they tell stories and you tell stories too, because that's the normal thing to do. Yeah. You don't think twice about it. You don't see it as a special skill. You just see it as, the ordinary thing that human beings do, they tell stories. Yes, yes. And then when we come to that imp improvisation, yeah. we, we used a lot of, of, of our lives there, you know, 
some of those who came from Johannesburg and others from Cape Town, you, you, you felt in their stories, the, their environment and their concerns and how they lived their lives there. And then that's when we realized that, oh, we are all characters in our own narratives, you see. We are all actors in our own, you know, theater that is unfolding every day um, in our real lives, you see. Yeah. Mm. And, and so in terms of the elders and the stories that they were passing down to you, um, would you say, would you classify that as a, a form of uh, knowledge transmission? Like, do, would you say that there was the history of the people that was coming down through those stories and people's beliefs and people's spiritual uh, practices? Was that also part of what was going on within those stories that would be given to the children? Yes, but to a much lesser degree, because in many instances, these stories are in fact uh, morality tales, morality stories, which were much more concerned with behavior and you know the norms, uh, the moral and ethical norms of the community, yeah. you know, as practiced by the characters in, in the stories, which would, in most cases would be animals, but there would be human beings too, Zelani, Ridimo, and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, you, you'll see, there were those stories, of course, the stories I'm, I'm talking about, you'll find that the reservoir of these stories would be women, you know, mothers, but most importantly, grandmothers. Mm. There, there were stories that were quite different. Um, for instance, genealogies, yeah. which then would contain history, those came from the men. Stories of what in, in, in my language they call envelope, in other words, where we come from. Uh, for instance, I could recite my genealogy for many, many generations, up to 20, you know, from the time my people left the Great Lakes. So you yeah. can imagine that that must be more than 800 years ago. Yeah. From that time, uh, from UCBC, who is the elder who led his people from the Great Lakes down to Southern Africa. Yeah. And I recite now, CBC they gave birth to so-and-so. So-and-so, you know, there was a lot of so-and-so begot so-and-so, so-and-so. Sometimes these will just be names, but in other instances, you would find that when that particular uh, person yeah. had something interesting that he did or was done to him, th that would be mentioned. So and so who did A, B, C, and D. And then we pass on to the next name, to the next name. So you find that you have your whole genealogy for generations and generations and generations. And the keepers of that then would be the men so obviously that happens when you are a, 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 a bit older. Yes. When you are no longer sitting there and listening to the, the stories that come from, from the grandmother. Right. Yeah. So why was there this division then where the, the, the stories that men told were so different from the ones that the women told? Because their, their lives were all different. Uh -huh. because ours were patriarchal societies even then, yeah. although it was a different kind of patriarchy from the one that was introduced by the British. Yeah. But the British you know, came with their very pointed kind of, of patriarchy. But even before they came, our environment uh, was quite patriarchal in that the men still saw themselves as the head, you know, yeah. of the household, you know, of the extended family. It would be the elder. The matriarch would still be respected. She had her own department in, 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 in many different things. Right. 
That is why even the stories, you see, the stories of uh, genealogies, the keepers of those stories would be the, the elderly men who then teach the younger men. There were even other stories which were even much more religious that you would learn when you go for initiation and circumcision. Oh. You see. So those were narratives that were much, much more religious in, in nature, you see. Oh. Yeah. So, I mean, there were those compartments where you find that. And then there would be, of course, praise poetry, uh, which yeah. also contained the history. Yeah. But in that case, more than just the history of the individual, it would contain the history of the, of the nation, of the community, of the society, mm -hmm. you see. But yeah. told through the ruling elites, through the chiefs of the time and the generals and the wars that they, they fought and so on and so forth. So you got this history from those who told you genealogies, but you also got it from those who told you about the rulers and the wars, you know, exactly like the, the griotic uh, tradition of, of West Africa. Yes. Yes. And then of course, there were those stories about behavior and morality that came in many instances from the women. Right. And these stories are, were so important that they were exported from Africa to what was called then the New World, which was uh, South America and North America. Uh -huh. Because uh, at one stage, um, I met uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, you know, oh. in one of these writers' conferences. Yeah. The, the, this one was in Spain. Yeah. And uh, he was telling us that, you know, people, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> uh, people, you know, talk of uh, my, my magic realism, but my magic actually is different from Gunther Grass's, Gunther Grass, the German yeah. author, yeah. magic. Yeah. Gunther Grass uh, magic, you know, is, is created by the author. He right. invents all these strange places. Thing. So Marquez was saying his magic actually comes from the society, the community itself. Uh -huh. In that uh, the traditions and the, the legends and, and all those things, the, the the, the spirituality and so on yeah. of, of the people. When they, these authors use it, they, they write of it, and, and you know all those things are very magical, you know those two. Yeah. They write of the beliefs of the people as if they were objective reality. Uh. Which means that the, the magic itself is created, you know, by, by the beliefs of those communities. Uh -huh. And of course, in, 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 in Colombia, where he lived and, and, and wrote, you know, you, 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 you have a very strong uh, community that descended from, from the African slaves. Yes. So Marquez was telling us that his magic comes from his grandmother. And then uh, he's asking us, now, do you guys know where my grandmother got her magic? Then he, uh, he answers himself, says, my grandmother got her magic from the old African women, the African slaves who were brought to Colombia, you know, centuries ago. Oh. So that's what fascinated me to say that his magic and mine have the same source, yeah, yeah. the African grandmother. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Wow, that is so fascinating. Yes. Uh, I'm, um, you know, I have this, uh, with, the, with the, the relatively little knowledge that I have of my lived experience and yes. 
being an apartheid survivor and all of that, that, that I know and, and things that I've learned from my elders, I feel this sense of urgency about storytelling that there's mm. so much that I want to have written down, um, yes. you know, before, you know, I'm unable to write anymore, whatever, you know, before I'm too uh. old, I, I don't know. But so I wonder with all this knowledge that you have from your elders, Yes. And uh, from your experiences, uh, storytelling in the Eastern Cape, I wonder if you sometimes have that sense of urgency um, as, a, as an artist, not just as a, as a writer, but as, as a storyteller in all different forms, because you, um, you're, you know, you're, uh, well, you're an artist in many ways. You're, you're not just a, a, a writer, but you, your storytelling takes different forms, right? You're, you know, you, you're um, a playwright, so play yeah. paint, so do you have this feeling of, of, of kind of panic of, of because I, I mean, part of what I, I, I was thinking is people are panicking so much about the stories that are written that are lost in books. And I yes. wonder if you have, if you have this so sense of urgency about the stories that you know, all the knowledge that you carry from all, all of uh, that, all of that oral storytelling. Yes, but with me, you know, um, I write the stories. Yeah already, for instance, in my novel, um, Little Sons, mm -hmm. the whole historical background of that, of that novel is the story of my family. My great, great grandfather yeah. who was accused of assassinating a magistrate in Som. And then there was a war there, you know, uh, where the British uh, wanted to capture him. Yeah. And his people fought against the British, but they were defeated. <laughs> and then he had to escape with his people, with yeah. us, uh, to Lesotho. That was in 1880, which yeah. is where he got, um, he got uh, a refuge. Mm -hmm. in southern Lesotho there. Yes. That's how we went to Lesotho in the first instance. Oh. Um, up to, to, to this day, there are all those Mdas there in southern Lesotho who are, you know, you know they, they call them Batebu there, you know, even yeah. though they're not related to the Tembus at all. So my fiction then is based on that. Yes. But I also write it in other forms as well. Uh, during COVID, yes. uh, among the books that I, I, I completed, because there, there was this lockdown that was happening then, um, was a libretto for an opera about my great, great, well, I don't know how many greats there, but it was in the 1700s. Uh -huh. when we calculate generations. Remember, I told you that we know our genealogy. Yes. So when we calculate that roughly, you know, a, 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 a generation is so many years, and that is very roughly so many years. This was around the 1730, long, long, long before colonialism. Wow. My great, great grandmother, whose name was Mamani, who was uh, Amampo, our people are called Amampondomis. She was a, a, a princess of the Amampondomis people. Yeah. Um, and then of course, when her father died, she insisted that she was taking over, even though that was against the, 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 the tradition. Uh -huh. When I say our, our cultures were patriarchal even those days, because only the, 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 the male heir would, would be made king. Yeah. But Mamani insisted that she's going to be king. And this is history. Um, and she was so powerful that um, she had a lot of, 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 of the military class supporting her because yeah. they believed you know, in her magic. They said, this person, has some aura, you know, about yeah. her. And, and indeed she did become king, not queen, but king. Yeah. And then she, 
demanded that she wanted to marry, but marry another woman. She, 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 had, re, she had rejected many suitors, uh, men who came, you know, who wanted to, to, to marry her then. Yeah. Uh, and they, they were even wondering, what was wrong with Mama? Her younger sisters, both of them have been married, they have children and so on. She, she, she is rejecting everybody. When she was king, then she instructed that they must go and fetch a, a specific woman from the Amampondo people, a daughter of Nyauza, who then was brought, they paid Lobola for her, and she got married to, to, to Mamani. That was the first known, you know, sanctioned by the nation, uh, same-sex marriage. Wow. So, I wrote this libretto for, for opera. Yeah. Uh, and I'm, I'm working with two composers now. One here in, in Johannesburg, uh, Florence Masebe's daughter, who's a concert pianist, but a very good composer. Another one who's a descendant of the, this very same people I'm talking about, mm -hmm. who's a, a, a lecturer in, um, uh, in New York, the Manhattan School of Music teaching. And this will be done by the uh, Cape Town Opera, oh. uh, jointly with the Baxter Theater and the UCT School of Music, you see, right. wow. in preparation for a festival in June, in July next year. Wow. So that, that story, that lesbian woman, was my great, great, great grandmother. Yeah. It's a very interesting and complex story because now when she was supposed to have an heir, she insisted that her brother, Simo, yeah. should make love to her wife. Wow. Uh, then, then the wife got pregnant and that's how then the heir came into being, the heir wow. to the throne. Yeah. Wow, so it was still, the heir was still blood related to her, but not from her. Uh, she didn't give birth to the heir, but it no. was still, it, but it was still her blood. Yes, uh, it, it was her brother. The, the father was her brother, the father of the heir. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and in passing that story down, was there some kind of moral judgment around? Oh yes, oh yes. There's moral judgment now as we speak. Ah. Because you see, fortunately, you see these stories are kept by our storytellers, our imbongis and so on and so forth. Yeah. Who then passed it? There's a white man in Grahamstown there. Uh, I just forget his name, Schwab. Yeah. Who, who, who wrote a lot of these stories from our poets, which means that now this one is what was written already in the early century, in early last century. Yeah. By this person who was collecting these histories. Yeah. But our poets still tell that story. What is happening with the elders of Amampondomise, who are my people? They are very angry with me. Because they say to me, now remember, these are people who have been Christianized now, the British came with yeah. Christianity and so on, which was very homophobic and yeah. all that. So they are as homophobic as the British who taught them homophobia. You yeah. see that? So they are ashamed of my mind. Mm. That is why even when they recite the genealogies, they, they would come with genealogy, so and so, because so and so, so and then they skip Mamani. And then they then talk of her son, to talk, you know, who, who became the king next, and then da 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 da. Yeah. You see? <laughs> they skip Mamani and they say so. To me, they say, now you are coming with these newfangled ideas of yours. Why do you think that? We no longer recite Mamani's name in our genealogies. It's because Mamani shamed us. 
he said, you are embarrassing us when you bring these old stories that we would rather forget. Right. But of course, history does not forget, you see. No, of course. So I tell them that, you know, for me, I see Mama Re Mamani as a hero, you see. Yes. Um, and you should not be ashamed of, uh, of your history because that's where you come from, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Yes. And of course, for me, Mamani falls under the good rather than the bad or the ugly. Yeah, yeah. So, of course, they can't stop me because they're just village people there. Yeah. I'm doing the play in Cape Town, the, the, the opera. Yeah, you yeah. See? yeah. Yeah. So one of the connections that you and I have always had or that, that I've thought about, but I don't think we've ever discussed it so much in person, is mm. the ways in which story comes to you. And, you know, I, we briefly, I remember you saying, I remember me being very um, haunted by a, a story that I was not writing. And I asked you and you, uh, how you deal with that. And you said, you know, I, if I, if I, um, if I want to write it, I write it. You know, you, you don't, you, you didn't seem to have this sort of control issue that I was having with characters. Yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> you see, I mean, I put it down in, in any case. Okay, oh, okay. Yeah, I, I, I put it down in my notebook. Well, it used to be a notebook, but now it's a file. It's a folder on, on the hard drive of, ah, okay. of, 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 of my letter. It may come as a as few notes and so on. Why? Because I know that one day it would come in handy. Uh huh. You know, uh -huh. as as facts and other elements of it accumulate, I write them down and so on. Uh, one day it is, is going to shape itself into a story. Ah, uh, okay. You know, it, it it won't happen just at once. Right. When I put it down there, I think I've forgotten about it, but some other idea will come one day and then I put it down and, and so on. It happens like that quite, um, oh. quite often. But sometimes, it, like in this book, in Little Sons, the one I was telling you about, yeah. the first two or maybe even three pages, exactly as they are in the book there, came as a dream. Oh, wow. And in many instances, you know that dreams are very incoherent and yes. haphazard and confused and all that. Yeah. But this one, that dream was so coherent exactly as I've written those first two or three pages. Exactly. Wow. That was a dream. Oh, okay. Wow. So I put it down then as the first three pages of my future novel. Uh -huh. I didn't even know what it was going to be about. You see? Uh -huh. It was when I was reading the, those first three pages and I said, ah, that's a novel that I must write about the exile of my people mm. after, they, after they assassinated the British magistrate. Wow. You see? So I ask about this at this point in, in our talk because I'm, I'm curious about um, how you came to write the story of your Mamani and if you feel uh, a sort of connection to her, if you feel like she, she, you know, speaking this, she's speaking in her story through you. Is that how you see it? Well, you know, the story of Mamani just happened by accident, really. Because in this very same book that um, I'm, I'm talking about, which is about my family and so on, yeah. I do mention here just briefly one or two lines when one of the chiefs is reciting his genealogy and then he skips Mamani. And then another questions, why do you skip Mamani? And then he says, no, we no longer talk about Mamani, my child. He, I mean, she disgraces us. And then he continues with genealogy and then it just ends there. Yeah. You know, because the, the, that novel is about something different. It was yeah. not about that. So this was just a by the way. Uh -huh. So one day I'm, I'm in Cape Town with a friend of mine uh, called Cook, uh, not Cook, yes, 
a Pumeza Machikiza. Yeah. Pumeza Machikiza is a lesbian. Mm -hmm. And then we are sitting there. I tell her about this story. I, I, I think we were discussing Canada. No, no, not Canada. Uh, we were discussing South Africa. So I'm saying Canada now because I'm, I'm talking with you. Yeah, and yeah. You, you, are, you are in Canada. I'm in Canada, yeah. She, she's based in, in Europe herself. That, that's where she's, she sings. She's a soprano. She's yeah. one of the famous sopranos there. She's based in Germany, in fact. <laughs> Although she sings all over there. Yeah. Uh, we're talking about something which had to do with, um, with same-sex marriage and so on and so forth. Then I said, do you know many people don't know that as early as the 1700s, there was a same-sex marriage that was recognized by, by the, the political order of the time yeah. in the Eastern Cape. So I tell her the story of Mama Ani then. Um, then she got fascinated by this, she says, why don't you write it as a libretto? And we'll get a composer and so That was many years ago. Yeah. I kept on promising her, oh yeah, I'll write it, I'll write it. Because she, you see, she, she said, that's a role I could play. <laughs> oh, mama, you see. Yeah. Make her a soprano when you write that, uh, that libretto. Oh, many years passed without my writing this. It was only during COVID. I said to myself, oh, I've written a novel during this COVID and I've painted many paintings. I've written another book, you know, Arula, a, a journey into 10 ancient African civilizations. Yeah. What else uh, sh should I be writing now? Then I, oh yeah, maybe I could write Pumeza's uh, uh, opera about my great, great, great grandmother. Wow. Then that's when I said, yeah, now is the time I've been promising her. I think she has given up on it anyway, but that's fine. If she no longer wants to do it, we'll do it uh, elsewhere with, with other yeah. people. Because I, I, it won't uh, rot, it won't decay. Yes. I can write it and put it there. One, one day somebody will do it. That's when then I sat down uh, to write this during the, the COVID lockdown, to, to write this libretto. Yeah. After I would finished it, then, then I thought, yeah, there we have a libretto. Uh, I sent it, she was the first person I sent it to. Now she had her own stuff going, you know, yeah. because that's the time also she was having the spirits and uh, that's the word is used mm -hmm. in, in our language. Yeah. I don't know because it's one of the key. Well, oh, yeah. You use the same word, okay. Same word, yeah. Yeah, because I think the Kasi Sotu is, is the same. Yeah. Because Akira Watsawa, she ultimately became a, a traditional healer. You know. uh -huh. Uh -huh. But still, you know, singing her opera and all that. Yeah. She, she never responded about that, even though, you know, she had been chasing me for it. So that's when then I, I, I put my team together. Mm. You see? Mm -hmm. I put my team together here in New York and then in Cape Town, Baxter Theater, uh, Cape Town Opera Company. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. They might still get her. I mean, if, if, if she's still interested. Yeah. Where, when they cast it. Right. Mm. So one thing I've, uh, this really leads into my next question. It's one, one thing I, I'm, I, I really love talking about, and I, 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 don't, think, I don't think everybody does, but um, I'm curious about your thoughts on this. So I once spoke to a Sangoma, a traditional healer mm. um, in South Africa, who said, you know, we were talking about healing uh, in general, in, in all different, different forms of, mm. of healing in the world. And she said, you know, artists, 
um, and healers are two sides of the same coin. Uh, he, artists are healers, but it's just a different kind of healers. So, you know, sangomas are one kind and, and artists are a different kind. Mm. And so I, I, I think, I, I, as you're telling me the story, Yamamani, I'm thinking about how the work that you're doing, mm. um, putting her, her story uh, back into the, the, the family story, is mm. actually to me seems like healing work because she's been erased. Um, yes. And to me, it seems like this is sort of generational healing work that, that is being done by you at this point. It, do you think of it this way at all? Well, you know, I never really thought of it that way. Mm -hmm. Although I've been told so. Uh -huh. What you are saying. Uh -huh. Uh, you see, I think another thing which um, which made me never to actually think about that uh, that seriously <laughs> is the fact that since high school, I've been you know fluctuating between being an agnostic and being an atheist. Mm -hmm. You see, so I never really I, I entertained any supernatural other world elsewhere, you know, because for me, my world begins and ends uh, within this world we are in now. Yeah. But having said that, a lot of members of my extended family are, are traditional healers, my uncles and my dad and so on and so forth. Yeah. And only a few days ago, uh, I was visiting the same Florence Maseve I, 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 I'm talking about here, yeah. who's one of, of our leading actresses. And amongst her guests was a traditional healer called uh, Aubrey Machitke. Uh -huh. And whilst people were cooking there, so on, I remained with Aubrey there. He began to tell me that he has read my books and whether I know it or not, whether I like it or not, I am a, a, a healer, ah. but instead of healing the way he does with his traditional healing uh, <laughs> skills and so on, I yeah. heal through my writing. Yeah. And then he says that not, not all writers are healers. There are some who are, there are some who are not. And he's able to find that when he reads somebody's work and there are those strong elements of healing yes i know that in my work there are strong elements of the magical but then that just comes from my grandmother yeah you see um but then also i know that even in western in the western sciences uh, i know that the so-called father of psychotherapy, uh, Freud. Yes. Uh, once wrote that uh, all artists are neurotic. Well, of course, we no longer use that word neurotic. <laughs> we have different words now, names. Yeah. Because the uh, neurosis was a general term they use for many different things. Here we, we use, you know, uh, clinical depression, we use GAD, you know, this anxiety, we use bipolar. For the, you know, during Freud's days, all those were just neuroses. Yeah. So he says that all artists are neurotic, but instead of manifesting their neurosis, in antisocial ways, they create art. Yes. So you, you, you see that even then in the, in, 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 in the Western sense, um, they came to that conclusion, you know? Yes. yes. They came to the, to, to the conclusion that had, that had, because you see, there's Sangomas and all those people they are part of that neurosis in quotes, yes. of course. Yes. Because that's not how they see it themselves as neurosis. 
Yeah, they are, they are, they are part of they are psychologists. You see, they, they, these healers and encompass different disciplines in there. Mm -hmm. They are religious priests and shamans. They are psychologists, but they are also medical people. You yes. know, the, the, in 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 the in in the physiological sense. Yeah, it's all in that sangoma or that that healer and so on. Right. You see. Right. Right. So they do a lot of Freud's work themselves. Yeah. Uh, you know, in the African tradition, rather yeah. than in the Western tradition of Google and so on. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. Hmm. Because so, I you, you know, um, some of these things, of course, I mean, they are far, you know, uh, there are things I've never really put my thoughts into them, but they are there, you mm -hmm. see. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. I mean, uh. I, the way I see that that's the way I interpret in your uh, journey with uh, with Mamani and uh. that that you are now healing uh, this this thing that has been done, which is that she's been erased and you are yes. now putting her her name. And, and you know, one of the things um one of the things that uh, there's a, a Canadian writer of uh, Ghanaian descent, and she, okay. her, her name is Essie Adujan, and she has recently. Oh yes, no, no, I I know of that right. Of course, oh. um, she she has recently uh, uh, written a series of lectures, uh, mainly, you know, doing what one might call sort of resurrecting ghosts or something like that. Like just really uh, speaking of the forgotten, the yes. people in, you know, black history. I mean, the history of Canada, black people in the history of Canada who, uh, have, been, who have been erased from the story um, yes. of what the country is. And I, I, I believe that that's healing work. And I, I think, you know, there are many different ways of it, uh, understanding yes. healing. And yes. I, I believe that, you know, saying <laughs> one of your ancestors uh, was saying she was here, she existed and she mattered is yes. a form of healing, um, healing that, that line. Exactly. That yeah. Yeah. So um, I, we don't have much time left, but I'm, I, I could talk to you for about five more hours. Mm. <laughs> um, maybe I'll just ask you, um, Um, so I want to say just in terms of writing and in terms of mm. being a storyteller and for, mm. for having, having been one, been one for so long, you know, we can mm. find ourselves in a world where publishers have very specific, specific expectations of, mm. um, indigenous writers, but you stayed very true to your, and very loyal to, to your people and your voice. And how have you managed to do that? And how have you managed to stay, um, true to yourself and true to your own kind of storytelling. Do you think, um, also, do you think that a bit of distance from South Africa um, has helped you do that? Or do you think that's just who you are and how you write and you could never be swayed by the expectations of publishers? Well, I, I think for me, it really doesn't matter where, where I am. Yeah. A lot of the books I've written, I've, I, Elsewhere, you know, in Europe or in in, in America, uh, ways of dying. I was in America, Madonna of Excelsior. I was in France, and so it, it it really doesn't make any difference because I carry my South Africa with me. Yes. Yes, is the baggage that I carry everywhere, so I don't have to be physically in, in here. In, in, well, I happen to be here now. Yeah. And strangely, ever since coming here, I don't have the edge to write anything. Yeah. You see? Yeah. Uh, because I'm, yeah, in this milieu, you know. <laughs> when I'm sitting there, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, you know, I'm able to then to, and you mentioned distance, that also does help in, in my case, you know. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, it, it happens like that, really. Um, there was a second part of, of, of your question, which I, I forget now. How you managed to stay loyal. Oh, and then with the publishers and so on and so forth. Yeah. 
Well, you know, uh, with publishers, fortunately, there has never been any problem with that because I write exactly what I want to write. Yeah. Uh, my work is only edited for what is known as copy editing, you know, uh, yeah. typos, what, what, what. Oh, yeah. you have used this word wrongly. Yeah, it means this or that. You know, that, that sort of thing. Yeah. It's never ed edited for the story mm -hmm. or the structure. Why don't we take this chapter and put it here? And that one, no, 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 no. It's published exact, and it's always been like that from day one of, of, my, of my writing. It's published exactly as I, I, I wrote it. Yeah. Um, in many instances, there will be some, you know, say, oh, this won't, won't sell because it's not written in a popular uh, uh, manner. Yeah. Then I said, it's fine. It's because, you know, if it doesn't sell, well, I don't say that to publishers because <laughs> they, they do want to sell. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I know that it's very likely it, it won't be a bestseller. Uh-huh. But I know already that I'm not a bestseller kind of writer. Mm -hmm. I am a critically acclaimed writer, but not a best-selling writer. Mm. So the two have, you know. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, you, you see. Yeah. So yeah. For, for me, that that is enough, you know, mm -hmm. to be critically acclaimed, even if I'm not a bestseller. Yeah. Then, of course, I'll remain poor but I'll be rich in other ways. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Huh, that's very helpful for me huh. as, somebody, as somebody who also considers herself critically acclaimed, but not a bestseller, right? Yes, yes, yes. Um, <laughs> it's helpful for me to hear that. There was a time when I thought, oh, I'm going to be such a bestseller and then I'll, I'll, I'll be a multimillionaire and all that. I'll, I'll buy my own jet. <laughs> That never happened. I, I knew that immediately. Immediately I was published in America and yeah. I was selling mostly, you know, to elite readers and then to universities and things like that. Yeah. My work is prescribed and all. Yes. But yeah, no, no, bye-bye uh, wealth. <laughs> I'll never be, I'll never be rich, but I just have to live with that. Why? Because I would rather write the books that I'm writing because ah. they live, you know, for for much more generations ah. than, than the popular uh, stuff. Yes. Yeah. So I, I I feel like I'm that kind of writer too. So I I, I think maybe you and I will take comfort in uh, <laughs> yeah. in each other's company then. <laughs> Yes. Knowing that we're never, I'm never going to buy a yacht or. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but yes, but yes. My, my work will have, hopefully, is having, I, uh, I, I hope, uh, the impact that I, I wanted to have. And certainly I can say I am writing the kind of books that I, I want to write, that the kind of story that I, I want to remain loyal to, or the kind of storytelling that I want to remain loyal to. So yes. it's good to hear you say this. Um, mm. especially somebody like you who has written so many more books and has had a, a much longer career than I have. Uh, uh, it's comforting. <laughs> yes. I won't, I won't be poor alone. <laughs> exactly. No, you know, it, 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 it's very like, very much like in music. <laughs> this yeah. analogy is very, very much like in music. For instance, yeah. in, in South Africa here, you have music who play, you know, uh, jazz, yeah. Zim Gawan and so on. Yeah. Uh, then you have, you know, the, the popular music uh, uh, people, the Kwaito, Mapiano, and so on. Yes. You know, very, very popular. When they drop a CD or whatever, you know, these popular ones, yeah. it sells in thousands and they make millions. Yeah within a very short space of time. And within six months, it's, it's out. Yeah. A new one has come in again. The jazz guy, Zim Nawane, that piece he has recorded 
will sell very few, but it will last for the next hundred years, uh -huh. selling a few each year, a few each year for, in other words, that music has longevity. Yes, yes. 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 Uh, it's the same thing then with, with the books that, that, that we write. There are those that are popular and will sell in thousands and will make millions within that one year. Yeah. There are those that are, you know, literary kind of fiction that will sell a couple of thousands, but, you know, will be in print forever because wow. it ends up being canonized. And then it lives in the academy and in, in, uh -huh. in all other places. Right. And that's how it gets to, to live forever. Right. It is well, the kind then that win if it is lucky enough, those important awards and so on. Right, right, yeah. right. Mm. Yeah. Well, this leads me perfectly into my very final question before we yes. close off. Um, so there's a, a Native American, uh, Indigenous American writer called Daniel Heath Justice. Okay. Who writes about the importance of Indigenous literature and Indigenous ways of uh, transmitting uh, stories. Yes. One of the things that he says is we need, <laughs> we need to learn to become good ancestors. Uh. Um, and I wonder, me hearing me say this to you, I wonder what would what it would mean for you to be considered a good ancestor. What would that mean? What would that look like? Well, me, I mean, I don't care about being a good ancestor. Ah. I'll be dead. <laughs> okay. I'll be dead anyway. <laughs> but then my work will speak yes. for, for me. That question is very similar to the question that interviewers uh, like to, to ask um, here in South Africa, for instance. They, they like the question, what do you want to be remembered as when you are gone? What do you want people to remember you as or, and all that? I always say that I don't care what people remember me. Well, well why should they remember me anyway? You mm. see, I don't care about being remembered. They must remember my work though. Mm -hmm. And I yes. think for me, for me, when I ask it, yeah. it's, not, it's not about being remembered. It's more yeah. about what kind of impact do you hope your work has had? Because however, not, I, don't have, I don't have control of, over how I'm remembered. I don't care either. But, but then even the impact, my darling, the impact, you do not know. Mm. You, are, you have no control over that. Mm -hmm. You see, you completely have no control. You know that your work does things that you never even thought it would do. I've had people come to me and say, hey, you know, this book, Ways of Dying, changed my life. Mm -hmm. Now, I never wrote ways of dying to change anybody's life. Mm -hmm. I was just telling a story. Mm -hmm. But there, it has an impact which actually scared me that, oh my goodness, do you know what it means to change somebody's life? That, that's very big. You, know, mm -hmm. you, you don't even know this person, then there you go, you change his life. Uh -huh. So I had no intentions of, of that. Then I then that's when I concluded that whatever I've done and left behind will do what it does. I will have no control of any of that, you know. Let it go out and do what it does. I'm gone. I've said goodbye. I'm gone. Mm, uh -huh, uh -huh. You see? Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's I, I haven't thought of it that way because I I have always I always tell myself that I'm not trying to have any control um, of over how my work is received. <coughs> but when you put it that way, I'm thinking, well, maybe I still am trying to have some control over how it's received. So it's a very and they, 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 there's nothing wrong with that, you know, wanting to have control how it, it is received. Then you'll be responding to critics or when they you feel like, oh, they are misinterpreting me. Yeah, let, let, let me correct this. So mm. I, I go, you, you, you get tired of that. Mm. 
Yeah, that's not work we want to be doing, no. Be because you'll be misinterpreted anyway. Yes. Whether you like it or not. Yeah. There will be those who love your work. Sometimes they love it because they are misinterpreting it. <laughs> you, 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 you didn't even say the things they think you are saying, which they love oh. and, and so on. <laughs> and sometimes, you know, they hate it because they are misinterpreted it again. Uh -huh. But all that doesn't matter because you have no control over it. How a person interprets that work, you are no longer there now. Right. It is now their story. Right. It's, it's no longer yours. It is theirs. Because even the, the, the act of reading itself is an act of storytelling. When you write that novel, you have left many gaps there. Some of them, you have left them purposely because you can't tell everything. Yeah. We know that character at some stage went to the bathroom. Yeah. But if that has nothing to do with, 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 with your plot or whatever, you leave that out. Right. I, as a reader, will complete the gaps that you left. And what do I use to complete those, those gaps? My own biography, my own life experience. That's what I use, which means that I take control of your story and fill the gaps with my own experience, my own story. And then I become a co-storyteller mm -hmm. with you, a, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. uh, you, you, yourself. Mm -hmm. That is why my interpretation of your story will be different from somebody else's and another person's and so on. We each bring our own biographies into that reading and then we make it our own story. Mm -hmm. That is why in many instances, we make you say things you even never thought you are saying in that story. Right. It's because we have brought in our own life history, our own biographies into right into your story and we have made it ours. That's what a reader does. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is why a story, for instance, that tells everything that has no restraint. The reader finds it boring, even if it, it could have been an interesting story. Right. Why is it boring? It's precisely because that writer has deprived the reader of the joy of filling in those gaps. Uh -huh. completing the gaps in order to be a co-creator of that story. Uh, okay, okay. Yes. I don't, yeah, I, I really love that. I, I don't think that we think of ourselves as co-creators of the story when we're reading, but I think it's very true. I think of course yes. it is. Of course we bring our own selves and our own experiences into our own reading experience. So, yes. yeah. Wow. Mm. Well, Zakes, affectionately known as Bra Zakes, yes. <laughs> as we all call you, it has been uh, such a pleasure talking to you. I'm so yeah. happy that, that we could we could find the time to do this. Um, right. You know, next time I hope we we meet in person and and continue the conversation or have a different kind of conversation. Yes. Uh, yes, yeah. indeed. So thank you so much for, for joining us from, from South Africa, from Johannesburg. And uh, it's a pleasure as always. And I look forward to seeing you in person, uh, hopefully soon. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Yes.